Hey class, welcome back from spring break. Let's uh, get going. Can people on Zoom hear me? I don't know if anyone can hear. Okay, cool. Yes. All right. Um, hope everyone had a relaxing break and hope you took the week off from staring at a screen and doing something outside. Um, did I know anyone do anything fun? Okay, one person. Okay, one person did all the fun for the class. Um, two people. Um, all right. Um, last time I saw you, you were looking at a midterm. Um, yeah. Uh, um, so uh, I haven't, we haven't finished grading the midterm yet. Uh, we'll be getting done with it uh, through this week. Hopefully, you'll get your grades back um, in uh, next I'm, I'm hoping by Tuesday. Next week, um, and uh, homework four is going to be available on Canvas uh, uh, start sometime tonight, and it will be covering learning theory. You'll have no programming and a lot of proving. I know it's fun, mostly math. Um, I know some some of you complained that there was too much programming, so we decided to listen to you. Um, and it's uh, you'll have two weeks to play with that stuff. Uh, and you know the same rules apply. You have a day of extension and such things. And uh, the other sort of milestone that's coming up is about your project. There's a project milestone that's due March 16th. And in case like me, you had to look at the calendar to know when March 16th was. It's Thursday, day after tomorrow. Um, it's not a particularly heavy milestone. I don't think the entirety of the project is going to be super heavy because you will be using most of the, most of you will hopefully be using code that you've been writing for your homeworks anyway. So for this milestone, you're required to submit one non-dummy thing, uh, make one non-dummy submission to Kaggle. And uh, if I were you, I would try to reuse the code from the first two homeworks. Uh, just pick one of them, one of the algorithms that we uh, uh, you've implemented, run it on one of the feature sets, and uh, see what comes and submit a, the thing on Canvas, on, on Kaggle, sorry, yes. So when you're going to run a non-dynamic session, you need to like check the box saying that it's one of these six. No, so that will happen at the very end. At the, at the very, so what I expect is most of you uh, will end up submitting more than six things. So in fact, uh, I think one of the times uh, when I ran this thing, at least one student had like 80 or 90 submissions. Uh, at the end of the semester, yeah, I know, they, they had fun with the project. Uh, so at the end of the semester, uh, you when you submit your final report, you'll also mark six of them as these are your official submissions. For now, I want one non-dummy submission. So just having one, oh, I understand. Right? Um, it's possible that this will be one of your final things. But it, maybe it's also possible that uh, uh, at the end of the semester, you feel like, yeah, this one was not so good. Let's try something else. Um, and uh, I also and I also want you to submit a report on Canvas. The report should describe what you did uh, with the data and the, some sort of statistics. One sort of easy uh, uh, statistic that I would exp I would probably do is uh, I would compute is just baseline. What, what do you get if you predict all positive, all negative? Uh, how many examples are there? And what's the distribution of uh, the various types of features? What's the dimensionality? Basically, I want you to take the data and compute things about it without running any machine learning algorithms and see what happens. And it's always good to kind of, when you're given a data set, don't just in general rush to apply algorithms on it, machine learning algorithms. Uh, it's good to get a sense of what the data distribution looks like. One of the first things I always do when I get a new task or a new data set is to uh, do what you already did with your dummy submission. What happens if I predict the majority label? Maybe the problem is solved. Maybe all examples have the same label. Why bother you know, doing more work than necessary? Um, it's also good to do that because that will give you a sense of what is a number below which if your algorithm learning algorithm predicts uh, achieves, it's probably really bad. So imagine, for instance, that uh, predicting all positive gets you 70% accuracy. 
and you have a fancy, fancy learning algorithm that gets you 60. Is that good? Is that bad? Maybe it is, maybe it's not. You have to think about it, right? I mean, maybe it gets 60, but it gets the the uh, the, 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 the label that is not the majority label is the one that you care about, and it does really well on that label. Right? So the, it's good to have a sense of what happens to your uh, data if you do not do anything fancy. The other kind of uh, uh, descriptive statistics that's probably worth thinking about is uh, uh, like some sense of a, the density of the data. For instance, for uh, one of your features, the dimensionality might be really large, but the number of non-zero features might be really small in any, any example. Is that happening? Is that the case? Or uh, what's the average length of the feature? What's the average, uh, 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 what do you call it? The, the distance of the, the, the feature of every example from the origin. What that tells you is, um, is your data kind of centered um, in, you know, it's also worth measuring if your data is centered in the high dimension space. Notice that I'm not teaching any of that in this class. So I'm not requiring that you do this or that kind of analysis. What I do require is for you to look at the data and get a sense of what it feels like. And this is a very vague thing. And hope the, one of the prerequisites for this class was, uh, at least for the undergrads, the, the foundations of data analysis, where you might have picked up a lot of skills for that style of analysis. So it just, it's good to do that uh, work. If you haven't done that prerequisite, don't worry about it. Um, it just go with your gut. I'm not going to be very rigorous on uh, expecting one kind of analysis or not. What I am going to be rigorous about is expecting a report and expecting that you have done something. And the report should also say what you plan to do next. Basically, this is my way of making sure that you don't do your project on the last day of the semester. Uh, and instead, this is the work is spread out across. Um, you do use Canvas for discussions. There is a discussion thread on uh, uh, around the project. I noticed that some of you have already started submitting on uh, these non-dummy submissions and the current leaderboard uh, uh, the highest accuracy on the leaderboard is 80, almost 84 percent. Um, doesn't really matter whether you beat it or not, but uh, it's good to have that sort of number to chase. Any questions about this? Yes. Ah, good. So this is connected to my third point. I want to do a go over the rules once again. Turns out that uh, one of the project rules in the PDF that I had attached was kind of self-contradictory. I cleaned it up. I will uh, post a new version later today. But here's the, the, the short version. You should have at least six non-dummy submissions. I'm not going to keep saying non-dummy from now on. Uh, let's assume that that's a given, six submissions. Um, uh, these six should uh, use at least four different learning algorithms. You should, use, you should use at least two different feature sets among the three that we gave you. And among these six, no more than one can involve a third-party machine learning library like TensorFlow or PyTorch or something. So let me give you an example of how you might satisfy all these rules. So we have three feature sets. We have PF idea. Um, Spacey embeddings and robust embeddings. The names don't matter. Let's call that feature set one, two, and three. Okay. We have already covered um, uh, this, the batch perceptron algorithm. Let's say that you use average perceptron. Average perceptron could be one of the algorithms. And let's say you apply that for the Roberta feature. So that gives you one submission. Average perceptron with uh, uh, TF IDF could be a different submission. Okay. Because then you've covered two different feature sets. Okay. You've already covered, you, you have an implementation of decision trees. So maybe you want to run decision tree on TFIDF. So that gives you a third submission. You're already, so does that make sense? Uh, in the rest of the semester, you will hopefully implement support vector machines. Well, you will implement support vector machines because that's going to be your next homework. You'll probably implement logistic regression also. That might also be your next homework or maybe the one after that. Um, we will cover ensembling. Ensembling is this idea where you have collections of, uh, you, you train a committee of classifiers. 
and you have them all vote on the final label and the, the majority label the majority label is the uh, true uh, is the prediction so for instance let's say you train uh, decision stops of depth no more than five and you train hundreds of them and you train thousands of them by just subsampling data many many times training a decision stump and you get thousand different classifiers and you just just have them all vote this is a style of uh, ensembling that we'll cover later this ensemble and by ensembling you can actually ensemble in many creative ways for example you can have decision stumps and then you can train a linear classifier on top of their prediction that's a different classifier so uh, let's say you have uh, you've decided on four different learning systems so let's say percept average perceptron decision trees svm and this ensemble over uh, decision tree okay and those are your four algorithms and maybe you decide to use uh, feature set one for all of them and feature set two for uh, average perceptron so that gives you five submissions right now for the first the last one you say you, you decide to play with pytorch uh, and you pick up a pytorch tutorial online maybe we can uh, provide some links uh, if you're interested and you apply a simple multi-layer neural network that you found on PyTorch to say uh, Roberta, and that's your sixth submission. This is just one way of doing this. I'm not saying that you should. There's going to be enough flexibility here that you get to pick what you want. Maybe you don't like the decision tree classifier because that homework was paid. Um, and so you don't want to use that. And so you want to use something else. So then you have to kind of uh, mix and match in other ways. Is this uh, does this uh, make sense? Any questions about this? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. And in the past, I'm trying to remember what I did in the past. Nashim, do you remember? Um, I know I had a policy on this, uh, and the policy was either yes or no. <laughs> uh, do you remember, Ashim? You didn't do the Kaggle thing at all. Um, so I think I would say no. Don't submit. So margin perceptron and average perceptron would count as essentially perceptron. The reason I'm going that way is because then you might say my six learning algorithms are decision tree with entropy, decision tree with majority, decision tree with the collision entropy, decision tree with something else, decision tree with something else, and then you get six things. Basically, you do you write around the same code six times. And it's not fun. Uh, the, the goal of the project is to force you to kind of explore a bunch of things. So let's say no. No, to be clear, to, to be clear, mild variants of the same algorithm do not count as unique algorithm. Yes. You may need to do pre-processing. I'm leaving that to you. I'm, that's your choice. Uh, the project is a little bit more open, right? You 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 may need to do some pre-processing. You may choose to do some pre-processing. Maybe you'll find, I, I, I'm just making this up. I truly have no idea. Maybe you'll find that uh, adding the Roberta feature and the uh, TF-IDF features gives you better results. I would be shocked if it does. <laughs> okay? Just adding those vectors uh, or concatenating them. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but uh, you, you may choose to do that. Maybe you may choose to square every element of the robot, of the spacey embedding. I would be utterly surprised if it does any better, but you know, those are your decisions. This, this is the reason I'm kind of leaving it a little bit open is because when you apply any learning algorithm out in the wild, this is exactly the kind of situation you'll have. Typically, you'll be given a task. You might have if you're lucky, you'll be given a task. Sometimes even defining the task is part of the problem. Uh, if you're lucky, you'll be given a data set that's already been featureized. And now you have to just figure out, I mean, when you apply these ideas in wherever you want to apply them, you won't, the, the, pro, the project won't be structured very cleanly like your home. You have, you'll be just, you'll be given a data set and you're told, go figure. And we're trying to kind of simulate that already. Not to that extent. We have already split the data into train and test. Uh, and I'm giving you these hints about you know using this and that and the algorithms, and we'll be available for discussions. But choices like feature transformation. Who knows? In the uh, in the wild, maybe some 
feature transformation. There is some magic feature trans feature uh, transformation that gives you a representation that is perfect. I don't know what that is, and probably you know it doesn't exist. But you have to if you feel like it, spend some time. Other questions? Yes. Uh, say that again. Deliberately given as features and what? Yes. Why not the actual? Oh, the actual text. There were two reasons for that. Um, the first one is uh, I wanted to kind of spare the pain of feature extraction, spare you the pain of feature extraction. Uh, that is not the point of this class. I mean, uh, at some level, data uh, uh, processing, pre-processing, and all that is extremely important and actually will make or break your machine learning system. But that's not the point of this class. And the second reason is this is a public data set. So if I gave you the raw features directly, uh, maybe you uh, so the, the raw text, you might be able to find the labels online. Mm -hmm. And sorry, you might overfit on something. There's there are many many things that could go wrong, and it just it is besides the point of the, the it 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 is irrelevant to the teaching objectives of this class. So I wanted to remove that on that uh, that aspect. Other questions? Other questions? Do get the milestone done. Um, it's another way of stress testing your code. Um, and if you feel like you know the the your this this is also another way for you to revisit your old code. And if you feel like your decision tree was not great, maybe you want to revisit it, and it allows you to uh, maybe re-implement it based on any feedback that you may have got. All right. Um, that was a long preamble for the actual content of the class. If there are no other questions, I want to get into uh, get back to computational learning theory. No questions. Okay. So we stopped in the middle of this unit on computational learning theory on positive and negative learnability results, just to kind of uh, come back to where we were. We were talking about probably approximately correct learning, uh, where the idea is um, you, we, we describe a certain concept class as learnable under this model. If using only a polynomial number of examples, you're able to guarantee that with high probability, you'll find a classifier that makes low error. And these things are uh, a little bit more uh, formally defined. But one of the things that we did uh, under this section was uh, to first consider the case where suppose you have a learning algorithm that give, that perfectly that produces a classifier that perfectly agrees with the training data. In other words, you have a classifier that's consistent with the training data. How big should that training set be for you to guarantee this epsilon delta uh, uh, performance? In other words, how many examples should a hypothesis be consistent with? before you can be certain that with high probability, with probability one minus delta, it will have an error less than epsilon on future examples. That's the setting that we're working with. So uh, to put it in a different way, imagine that you have a learning algorithm that gives you a classifier that's perfectly, that gets perfect training accuracy, something like your decision tree. And you desire that this hypothesis gets a low error, error less than epsilon. Or rather, you desire that this learning algorithm gets you such a classifier with high probability. It is quite likely that this learning algorithm will give you a good classifier. How many examples should such an algorithm encounter before it can make that promise? And what we found was this, uh, this expression here. If the number of examples, m, is greater than this quantity, then with high probability, the, the, the classifier that it produces, the, the, the a classifier that is consistent with those many examples will have error less than epsilon. The important points here are epsilon is the error that you desire. 
delta or one minus delta is the confidence in your learning. Delta is a small number. One minus delta is the probability that your learner succeeds. You want that probability to be high, so you want delta to be small. H is your hypothesis space that your learner explores. The key point here is this quantity depends on the log of the size of the hypothesis space. So if your hypothesis space that your learner explores is going to be large, you need to have more examples to have the same guarantee, which almost basically just gives us a recipe for deciding whether something is fact learnable or not. Because given a new concept class, you need to find the size of the hypothesis space, apply it into this, uh, you know, put it into that uh, expression. And if this whole thing is polynomial in one over epsilon, one over delta, and the dimensionality, then it's fact learnable. If it's not polynomial, it's not fact learnable. This is essentially the recipe that we're going to apply a few times today. Um, something that we already did in the past, but I want to revisit is uh, general conjunctions. General conjunctions are functions of the form A and B and C, where this can be a variable or a negation, or well, this could be some other variable. This is a conjunction. So uh, I'm not going to go over the details of this, but the number of uh, general conjunctions in uh, n variables is 3 power n, which means the only thing that really matters is log of the size of the hypothesis space, log of 3 power n is n log 3. So if I plug this in, if I have m greater than 1 over epsilon times n log 3 plus log 1 over delta number of examples, life is good. Well, by the way, this quantity, the number of examples needed is called the sample complexity. And what we have here is the statement that the sample complexity is linear in the in 1 over epsilon. It's logarithmic in 1 over delta and it's linear in n. Overall, it's polynomial in all these things. It's no more than polynomial in all these things. So this expression is polynomial. So this concept class H, which is the set of general conjunctions, is fact learnable. This is the kind of statement that we are going to make again and again. Questions about this? This is roughly where we stop. And you know, I, I, I went through a few examples, a numerical examples of what this means. Um, just for the sake of uh, completion, I'll just talk about this example once more. Suppose you have 10 Boolean variables and you want a 95% chance of learning succeeding. In other words, one minus delta is 95%, is 0.95, which means delta is uh, 0 0.05. You want at least a 90% accurate classifier, which means epsilon, the error that you are allowing yourself is 0.1. And so we just plug all of this in. So you have one over delta, and then you have one over epsilon here. The dimensionality is 10 log three. You just plug all that in, you get 140 examples, so roughly. So this says that if you have uh, in 10 dimensions, if you have 140 examples and you have a classifier that's consistent with all of them, then with high probability that classifier, you have a learning algorithm that produces a classifier that's consistent with all of them. Then with high probability, that learning algorithm will produce a classifier that is uh, going to have an error less than 0.1. With probability how much? With probability at least 95%, the error of future on future examples is going to be less than 0.1. Um, and you know, because the uh, n here, the dimensionality is linearly um, controlling the sample complexity. If you increase n to 100, then this roughly goes up 10 times. 140 becomes about 1,000. If you increase uh, the confidence from 95 to 99, this number only slightly increases uh, because the, uh, the one over delta has a logarithmic dependence, which means you know it's not going to blow up. Questions before we talk about a different concept class? Yes. That's right. This is true for any learning algorithm that guarantees this consistency property. Any learning algorithm that is guaranteed to be consistent, that, that guaranteed to produce a hypothesis that's consistent with all the data will have this problem. 
which is kind of cool. This is a theory that doesn't, you know, it's a theory of learning, but it's not about any one learning algorithm, um, which is a little uh, strange, but also interesting. Other questions? But the game that we are going to play is essentially the same. Given a new concept class, we'll just count the number of elements in that concept class and check whether that log of that quantity is polynomial in the dimensionality. If log of that quantity is polynomial in the dimensionality, we will declare that concept class as pack learnable under that consistent learning learner model. So let's do one more. Uh, this is a set of uh, functions called three CNFs where you have a conjunction. So you, you have these things are, you ignore those things in the boxes, but you have a conjunction connecting them. And the thing in the box is an expression that has at most, well, at most three literals connected by an R. So something like say X1, X2, X3, or X1, or not X2, or not X17. These are, um, these are both three conjuncts. So conjunct conjunctions, uh, these are co the elements, um, disjunctions with at most three elements. And I, I can take an and of all of these and I get a three CNF. Functions of this type are called three CNFs. The, the game is the same. We need to count how many three CNFs there are. This is a slightly more involved uh, computation. So let me walk you through this process. So every conjunct here can have at most three expressions. So before we talk about why we are playing, the, uh, what the, how to do the counting, let's kind of revisit why it's worth counting. Our goal is to uh, ascertain the sample complexity. In other words, we are asking the question, if I have a learning algorithm that's consistent with a certain number of examples, how many, how big should that number be? To, for, uh, for the pack learnability. That number is the sample complexity and that uh, I'm, I'm trying to compute the expression on the right-hand side. The only thing that I need to really count here is the size of the hypothesis class. So how many three CNFs are there? First of all, we have these conjuncts, right? So you have something or something or something. This can have, you know, to n elements because you have either a variable or its negation. So I can have an x1 or not x1, x2 or not x2, and so on. So I have n variables, I have two n things that can go into the first class. If I have picked one of these elements, let's say I picked not x1, then of course I can't reuse not x1 in the second slot, but I also can't use x1 because x1 or not x1 becomes true. It's uh, irrelevant. So maybe I can, uh, I have two n minus two things here. And here I've made a, let's say I've chosen something else. So I've chosen x17 here. And now I cannot use not x17. So I cannot use x1, I cannot use not x1, I cannot use x17, I cannot use not x17. So that leaves me two n minus four choices here. So the number of possible things that you can have is the product of these three things, two n times two n minus two times two n minus four. But honestly speaking, it doesn't, the exact numbers doesn't really, don't really matter with some minor, there are minor variations of the scheme. If you go from three to at most three, one way or another, you'll end up with order of n cubed. Question. No, 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 no. Ah. Yeah. So if you do at most, you'll still end up with order of n cubed because the others will kind of uh, uh, still be less than cubic. So the number of, conjuncts there are is n cubed. You have n cubed things. So let's now, uh, and in my slide, I probably said two n cubed. That's just silly. I should have just said n cubed. Um, okay, now, given that you have n cubed things, I need to pick some subset of them and connect them with an end. I'm not allowed to use any negations here. So I have, n cubed objects that I can put here and I can, you, you see where this is going. So, sorry, I, one of the n cubed things can go here. One of the n cubed things can go here. One of the n cubed things can go here, or I can just leave the slot empty. So there are n cubed slots and each one can either take that 
the conjunct that you built, or you can have an empty plot. So, how many different, uh, 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 you know, 3CNFs can be built? Well, the, the reason I can do that is because a 3CNF is nothing but a simple conjunction of these objects. You've already seen how many simple conjunctions there are with n variables. How many are there? It's two to the n. Well, if you have n variables, you can construct two to the n conjunctions. If you have n cubed variables, you can construct two to the n cubed conjunctions. Okay. Right? So the number of three CNF is order of two power n cubed. I'm ignoring some constants here, but uh, roughly that's the number. Questions before we uh, construct a sample complexity. Yeah. No, that's for arbitrary conjunction CNFs. Arbitrary Boolean function. This won't, yeah, this won't work. But also remember that this is just about sample complexity, it's not about computational complexity. But I will point out that it's also learnable computationally. So, but okay, so what we've done here is count how many 3 CNFs exist. Roughly 2 power n cubed 3 CNFs. I need to take the log of that. If the log of that is polynomial in n, life is good. Well, log of that is order of n cubed because log of 2 power n cubed is n cubed and some constants. We don't care about constants. So once again, we are done. What we what we've been able to show here is because the log of the size of the hypothesis class is polynomial in the dimensionality, and that's the only expression here that is controlled by the hypothesis class, the sample complexity itself is polynomial in the dimensionality. It's already polynomial in one over epsilon. It's already polynomial in one over delta. So the sample complexity is polynomial in all the required complexity factors, which means three CNF are path learnable. You know, but you know it's pack learnable in the consistent learner model. Specifically, what that means is if you have a learning algorithm that can produce a, a, a three CNF that's consistent with a data set, then a classifier that's produced by that learner with high probability is going to make low error, provided you see these many examples. And the number of examples needed is polynomial, so life is good. So sample complexity is polynomial in N. There's a question of computational complexity. You still, for pack learnability, you still need to show that this there exists a learning algorithm. What, what we have been able to show here is that this is pack learnable. There is enough information among uh, these many examples to be able to tease apart a good classifier. It doesn't mean that there is an algorithm that can actually find that classifier. We still need to invent an algorithm that can actually find that classifier efficiently. I'm not going to talk about how to find that efficient classifier. I'll leave it as an exercise. Think about it. It's uh, kind of a fun sort of a puzzle to play with. Uh, if you you know want to spend a Saturday evening with nothing better to do. Okay, let's now uh, switch gears. Uh, talk about a different class of function. All Boolean functions. What we saw was conjunctions are pack learnable. Three CNFs are pack learnable. Well, maybe everything is pack learnable. And pack learnability itself is a meaningless concept. If everything is pack learnable, what's the point? How many Boolean functions are there if you have n variables? Two to the two to the n. And okay, that's great. What's the log of that? Of two is still two power n. So log of the size of the hypothesis class is exponential. This is in the dimensionality. So this expression here is exponential in the dimensionality. That means the entire sample complexity is exponential in the dimensionality, which says in order to guarantee anything about a classifier that produces, uh, an, that searches the space of arbitrary conjunctions, a learning algorithm that searches the space of arbitrary conjunctions, you need to see an exponential number of examples. 
exponential is outside the limit that pack learnability sets. So uh, general conjunctions are not pack learnable. This is the second time we are encountering the same point that general conjunctions are not learnable. We already saw that in the mistake bound model. General conjunctions are not learnable in the mistake bound model. Turns out they are not, sorry, not general conjunctions, general Boolean functions. General Boolean, all Boolean functions are not learnable in the mistake bound model. Turns out they are not learnable in the pack model either. And in both cases, essentially the same problem hits us. The number of conjunctions or the, the number of Boolean functions is super exponential, which means we just cannot disentangle a good function out of that set using only a polynomial number of examples. It doesn't matter whether we are doing it in a mistake bound style of learning or whether we are doing it in the batch style of learning. We just can't do it. Questions? Yes. What is N here? The dimensionality. How do you set? I don't understand that. Uh, well, if, if it's, uh, it's yes, yeah. okay. You can say, oh, without let's let's okay. Let's pick a number. Let's say n equals ten. Okay. What is two power ten? 1024. 2 to power 2 power 10 is whatever that number is. That's the number of functions your learning algorithm has to search. So it's basically not worth it. That's one argument. The second argument uh, is we are not, we don't have the liberty to pick n because n is a complexity parameter. It's part of the input that uh, is part of the uh, parameters that are in the definition of pack. The sample complexity needs to be polynomial in the dimensionality. That's one of the conditions, you know, Leslie Valley defined it. Who are we to change it now? You want to change it, make your own definition. <laughs> uh, so the, the, at least for pack learnability, dimensionality is not something that we are allowed to say. And it turns out even for uh, the mistake bond learning, and it's a reasonable thing to note that we cannot fix the dimensionality because we are not talking about a particular learning algorithm or a particular data set. We're talking about learnability of functions in general. We do not know what that function class might be. And if we restrict ourselves to only functions of these many features, it's a much more restricted statement. It may be an interesting statement in itself, but at least uh, that's not the point of this, uh, what we're doing. Other questions? Did you have a question? Okay. Yes. Yes. That's right. Yep. Okay. So uh, I'm not going to keep proving all these other sample complexity results. Uh, it turns out that uh, a whole bunch of other functions are also fact learnable uh, because they have polynomial sample complexity. We saw three CNF. Uh, where we can have uh, three things, uh, three literals here, something odd, something, and another three things, and so on. KCNS is the same idea, but with K things. The num uh, every disjunctive class has at most K literals. That's fast learnable. And I'll leave it as an exercise for you to count how many KCNFs there are. Um, turns out the sample complexity will be n power K. Um, and then uh, K class CNF is basically the same idea. Um, well, it's not the same idea. It's basically you have a, uh, a disjunction. You have a conjunction. Let's say this is three class CNF. So you have a conjunction of three things. And internally, inside this, you can have a disjunction. I can have uh, X1 or X2 or X3. Any number of things can be uh, connected by disjunction. The important thing here is this is a three class CNF because there are exactly one, two, three classes. And uh, so it's a conjunction of at most three disjunctive classes. Um, I have, you can talk about KDNF. So KDNF is basically it just change the and and ors. You swap the ands and ors in a CNF. A K term DNF is, you know, the, it's like this here. 
This is kind of annoying detail, but uh, it's a laundry list of function classes. They are all pack learnable. Um, and I, you can go over the slides later to get their formal definitions. And uh, it's worth spending a little, little bit of time proving that they are actually pack learnable in the consistent learner model. All you need to do is to count how many functions there are. And this is a good exercise uh, if you want to kind of get to the, you know, get a good sense of how this process works. Now, among these, one of them is actually interesting. So I want to dwell on that a little bit. A K term DNF. A K term DNF is uh, uh, some, a two term DNF would be something like you have some, you have one term here and another term and you connect them both with an OR. This is by the way, a Boolean OR. And internally you have as many things as you want, a conjunction of whatever you want, all as many features as you want. So you have one big conjunction or another big conjunction. That's a two term DNF. A three term DNF is one big conjunction or another big conjunction or another big conjunction. And K term would be K such things. In, in particular, especially of interest is this two term DNF. Suppose you want to learn a two term DNF. I already told you that all these classes have a polynomial sample complexity. So, which means that all of them are pack learnable. Suppose you want to learn a two, suppose I have a function. I know that that function is a two term DNF. And I'm not going to tell you what that function is. You know that function is a two term DNF. Let's say you, 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 I'm asking you to invent a learning algorithm. A learning algorithm is simply search over functions, right? So, what is the search space? What, what search space would you use? for exploring this, uh, for discovering the function that I hold. In other words, suppose you want to learn a two-term DNF, what should your hypothesis class be? This is not a trick question. Well, it's not yet a trick question. Similar to similar to no, I mean, the most obvious thing would be two-term DNF. If I tell you that I dropped a ring under the tree and I need to find it, I'm going to search under the tree. Seems like a reasonable thing to do. Well, not so much. It turns out the set of functions that are two-term DNFs, even though you may they are pack learnable according to sample complexity, exploring that set of functions is not computationally feasible. So this is one of these another one of these uh, sort of counterintuitive ideas. The it's the the function class that you have. Uh, is even if you know that the function class you have is uh, uh, a two-term DNF, it's not a good idea to search that set because it is not computationally feasible to search that set. It's there's a uh, I can point you to a paper that proves it. In other words, this is an example of a function class that's pack learnable but not efficiently pack learnable because of the computational complexity issue. There is no learning algorithm that can search that space. Efficiently, unless p equals np. That's basically the argument. But there's something else here. This is, uh, it gets even more funny. Um, in a, a few slides back, I told, we talked about uh, three CNFs, right? And I said, I asked you to spend some time as an exercise to invent a learning algorithm for learning a three CNF. And I also promised that it's an efficient, there is an efficient algorithm. And I'm not. I'm going to dwell on the proof of this, but it turns out that this set, if you if, if you call this two term DNF, K term DNF, is a subset of KCNF. So let's kind of uh, this this slide has a lot of notation. You can ignore the notation at the bottom, um, uh, but let me kind of tell you the big picture. K term DNFs. And KCNFs are both both have some polynomial sample complexity, which means using only a polynomial number of examples, there is enough information to identify. Uh, sorry, there is enough information using in a polynomial example that can uh, such that if a learning algorithm found a consistent classifier with high probability, it's going to be good in the future. So that's the first thing we know. Second thing we know at the top of the slide is searching the set of K term DNFs is not efficient. There is no efficient algorithm to search uh, K term DNF. And yet, 
KCNFs can be searched efficiently. You have a larger set that can be searched efficiently and not the, not the subset of it. So if I want to learn a K-term BNF, should I be searching K-term BNF? No, because I can't do it. Instead, I will launch a search process in this entire set, in the KCNF, because K-term DNFs are inside it, my learning algorithm will find a classifier that's perfect. If I, this is weird. If, if, you are, if you don't find this to be strange, you haven't been paying attention. Yes. So, I mean, the two-term DNF is empty hard. Yes. But learning a problem that that is a subset of it's not. Yes. We are. This is pretty usually that you reduce from one a harder a problem to another problem. I think it's an example of uh, a much simpler uh, situation where that happens. Imagine that I have, um, imagine that I have a grid of numbers in a, in a two dimensional grid of numbers. And there is one number there, one, one element in that grid that I need to find. And I also tell you that uh, the two dimensions are independent of each other. Either you can go along this dimension or that dimension and you'll find the number. So you just need to explore one of them, right? On the other, so the, the, rather than me painting with my hands, imagine that I have, this is my grid. And let's say my magic number is three. For some reason, you need to find that element. It doesn't matter which row you pick, you can find it here. You just need to walk, it's the same as walking over a list, right? On the other hand, suppose now I uh, say that these things are the only things that are interesting. And now I start giving, uh, instead of magic number being three, these are all, uh, some other values. So basically, I introduce extra constraints. Adding extra combinatorial constraints might kind of make the space more complicated. So searching that space becomes harder. So you might have to walk through a more complicated path. Actually, I should have used an example with a maze. Um, if I need to get from point A to point B of a room, I can just walk across if there's nothing in between. But now, because all of you are sitting here, I can't walk across. I need to go around. I need to do more work, even though the space that's allowable for me is a strict subset of the full room. So kind of like how one CNF is Yeah, yeah. But this is, you know, it is a bit counterintuitive uh, and it requires some, uh, it requires a theorem. It's this, you know, don't take me on my word. This is another one of those strange situations that we will encounter. This is, we've already seen one of those. Um, in other words, what we have here is that the concept K term DNF is better off being learned as a KCNF because it's both efficiently searchable and K term DNF are have polynomial sample complexity, so light is good. Um, if you like pictures, imagine that you have the set C and there is a hidden function that's uh, one of the elements, the dot there. What we are doing is instead of searching that set, we are constructing a much larger set that contains that entire set and searching inside that, knowing that. Of course, the, the algorithm that we have is going to succeed on any element of, of, of the of H, in particular, anything inside C as well. Now, turns out this idea keeps coming up again and again in machine learning. This is uh, again the point about uh, 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 nothing about representation. Some concepts cannot be learned in one representation, but they can be learned in a more expressive ex representation sometimes. It, you can think of it as a point about features or about a representation of classifiers. These are kind of related concepts. We've already seen this idea before. Uh, when I told you that, uh, you know, if I want to learn linear, if I want to learn a conjunction or a disjunction or a M of N function, don't start inventing learning algorithms for each of these. Just use a linear classifier. Linear classifiers contain all of these. So might as well just use one algorithm to work with all of these concept classes. So now it's just another instance of a similar sort of a idea. Questions?
we've seen a bunch of uh, positive and negative results, and I'm going to list a few more. Uh, uh, in particular, a bunch of negative results. There are two types of learnability or non-learnability results that this theory actually gives us. One of them comes from the complexity theory, uh, theory point of view. In other words, um, there is no uh, efficient algorithm to find uh, uh, a good classifier. Uh, well, to be more precise, a concept class cannot be learned unless p equals np. Typically, that's the form that all these proofs take. Um, the other type of non-learnability result comes from the information point, which just says the sample complexity of this particular class of functions is bad. The concept class is so rich, so uh, like all Boolean functions, that only a polynomial number of examples is not going to be enough to find a good enough approximation. Uh, typically, this so, uh, this sort of a proof involves learning, uh, you know, counting the number of functions of such things. Just a laundry list of negative results. From the complexity theoretic point of view, we already I already mentioned K-term DNFs uh, cannot be uh, learned because there's no efficient algorithm to explore that space. It turns out neural networks of a particular architecture cannot be learned. And it's a very, very simple architecture. We, we've not yet covered neural networks, but uh, those of you who know it, this is a neural network which has two layers and exactly three nodes uh, and n inputs. And it cannot be learned. It's a very cool paper from 1998. Uh, there's something called read once Boolean formulas where any variable occurs only once, cannot be learned. And uh, if you involve quantifiers like for all or there exists, learning becomes really hard. That's from the computational complexity point of view, where it, it says there's no efficient algorithm to explore that space uh, to find some classifier, even though maybe the sample complexity is okay. The other type of non-learnability is uh, information theory, which says that there's no, that only a polynomial number of examples is not going to give you enough information to find a good classifier. Under this, you have uh, arbitrary Boolean functions. We already saw that. You prove that. You can prove that now. All it takes is counting the number of functions and taking the log. Uh, finite state machines. Those of you who have taken uh, theory of computation, deterministic finite state machines are not learnable uh, in this consistent learning model. Quantistic grammars are not learnable. Turns out many, many interesting functions are not learnable. And yet, we seem to be doing OK. Uh, and we have things like chat GPT. So there's some mismatch, and we have to think about why that happens. Questions? I'm using chat GPT as an example uh, of something that's successful. I'm not necessarily claiming that it's good or bad here. Um, that's a different conversation that we can have later this morning. 